does this make me happy? Or am I just doing this, trying to boost my CV, get these clubs in my CV to put this in my social media handle so I look good in front of others? Like, and it's just like, is this the life I want? I want I lived in, I've worked in 11 countries. I want to keep moving from place to place, never having a home, can get sacked after a number of months. I have a little bit more stability now. And that's what I like. That's what I enjoy. I'm living in a beautiful place with beautiful beaches, one of the best like tourist destinations in the world. Let's talk about maybe your passion for coaching. How did that come about? So if we kind of begin at the beginning of your journey. How did coaching become a an intrinsic drive for you, something that you wanted to, to pursue as a career? Well, as soon as I could walk, I've been kicking kicking round objects. So I've been playing football my whole life. So that's my biggest passion. And then once I reached the stage where I knew I wasn't going to become a professional footballer, I didn't know what else to do with my with my life really. And it's it's just funny how circumstances happen. Like uh there was a a work placement with the Irish Football Association, which I just happened to fall into because my mum knew someone and she kind of encouraged me to go to university. And during the first year at university, there was an opportunity to coach abroad in America. And that was when it really happened for me because before like, I was doing voluntary coaching and things, but it wasn't really seen as a, as a career. Like when in university, on the first day, everyone's hand went up, sports science degree, sports studies degree. I want to be a PE teacher. So everyone wanted to be a PE teacher. I was one of few people in the classroom that wanted to be a football coach because where I came from, the, there weren't jobs, there weren't many full-time jobs. So once I went to America at the end of my first year at university, I saw foreigners from around the world in full-time positions. And that's when I realized that this can actually be a career for me. It's interesting you mentioned kind of your, your Irish upbringing. I, can, I get the sense, I come from a, an Irish background, that sport is very integral in terms of the community. And did, did that become part of your kind of inner fulfillment to, to be a coach because of the surroundings in your upbringing? Yeah, definitely. Football's, football's part of the fabric. You, my friends all play us and I joined them. It's just it's just the main thing you did. Anytime weekends after school, you'd always be playing football. That was just that's just the thing you did. The, la- the landscape is much different nowadays, but back then that was the, the main kind of entertainment you had, just playing football in the streets. So what do you enjoy the most about coaching? What What is it that kind of has enabled you to, to share your experiences and share your journey with others uh, across the world. What is it that you enjoy about the process of delivering coaching to to individuals and groups? Just the buzz you get off people, like giving them positive experiences, playing sport, helping people improve, and then seeing when they put themselves in the pressured situations that they can handle these things. It's it's basically the people, the people you work with, and the coaches as well, the people around that. And also for me, I've been able to mix coaching with traveling as well. Like it's basically paid for me to travel the world. So it's it's completely transformed my life in that sense. And like I'm very grateful for it. But like initially the start of it is love of the game and in love of helping people and creating sessions. And and for me as well, there's such a bigger impact you can have through coaching. So like where I was, New Bon Ratch, Italian, in Thailand, we're able to set up like coach education programs. I haven't been there before to help people, like schools programs and just giving people up board and and build something in the community. So it's like, you can have such a wide range of impact through coaching. And I think that's just so powerful. Can you maybe just elaborate on, on what it was that kind of made you driven towards traveling and, and sharing knowledge across the world? Yeah, I suppose that, that was a trip to America and changed everything. Cause before that, I wasn't very well traveled. Like I'd usually just stay in Ireland on holidays. I never really went abroad. It was only really football playing. I went to a tournament in Holland when I was younger and a few different things, but I wasn't very well traveled. So I went to America, we were coaching in different locations every week. So we're traveling over the place. I was coaching in Canada, in Montreal, the family I stayed with in um, New Hampshire. There was someone down, somewhere down south in America. They took me to New York City and organized a helicopter flight for me all around the city. And it's just like these experiences and the people you're meeting and seeing different parts of America. It was just such an amazing and exciting experience. And that was kind of what kickstarted my love for traveling because before I hadn't really done so much. Mm. Is it all about, in that sense, kind of taking yourself out of your comfort zone? You mentioned um, not really traveling previously as an adolescent. Did you have to kind of maybe think about that in terms of, okay, I need to put myself in situations where I need to grow and, and, and kind of deal with these cultural differences and language barriers as well? Did, did, did that kind of become a process for you as well? Yeah, I kind of just threw myself into it. I've never really thought about it. I just saw this opportunity came up. I thought that's a great way to spend the summer during the holidays. So I went for it. And then from there, it just made me realize that this is so exciting. It wasn't necessarily about testing myself. It was just that this was an amazing opportunity, a great way to spend your summer. And then things kind of spiraled from there. Talk to me about the process of obviously America. You come back home and then 
was there an agenda to kind of go, okay, I'm going to try and make this as a, as a kind of a career in terms of coaching in different areas, or was it something that just kind of you fell into? I'm, I'm intrigued to hear how that process worked and how that became apparent for you in terms of your, your coaching profile. Yeah, well, Amer America sparked everything. So when I came back to there that summer, I set myself the goal of coaching in five countries and then become an academy director of a professional club. So I finished my degree, degree got the B license level, and then the day after I presented my master's research, I moved to work for Arsenal Soccer Schools in Kuwait. And that was just the start of things, trying to achieve that goal of working in five countries, but now I've far, far surpassed it. Yeah, well, the cultural is the biggest thing. And like when you go to American things, the adaptation is not as big, but the language and terminology is so big. Like the name, it's called soccer. It's not called football anymore. <laughs> and there was one training session. I was asking a young boy called Joey to tackle someone when I was like 18. And he went and the American football tackled someone, absolutely wiped them out. It was awesome, absolutely awesome tackle, but it's not quite what I was asking him to do. So it's just like the terminologies and the lingo and things, that was probably the biggest the biggest difference in America and also how the sport and things are structured. So going to America wasn't that big a, big a transition, but the other changes after that, going to Kuwait in the Middle East, that was a starting to get a lot different in terms of the culture. And then once I went to China after that, China was probably the biggest culture shock in terms of having to adapt and then again in thailand as well because like in china i was kind of working in a mixed environment so it was a bit in international schools it was a bit in local schools whereas when i went to thailand i was fully immersed in the countryside in thailand like no one spoke english there were no foreigners there so that was when i really started to understand how things work and like i made a lot of mistakes so for example there's an age hierarchy so there, there's sort of an age hierarchy in Europe as well, but it's a much more prominent in Asia. So I went in as academy director at a professional club at the age of 25, and I was kind of the boss in that academy environment, even though I was the youngest member of staff. So that was a very difficult transition in terms of the other coaches being older. And also when I went in there, the president's son was the academy director, so the standards weren't very high. So I went in and started trying to make them do their jobs properly in terms of planning sessions, like doing workshops, different things to try and develop ourselves. And they didn't like that at all because they were being asked to do a lot more work for the same amount of money. And there's this young foreigner coming in. They'd never worked with foreigners before. So that was a very difficult transition. So, and also I'd been hired as a quick fix because the president's son had made a lot of mistakes in the academy as well. So I was basically thrown in at the deep end and I made so many mistakes, but learning from those and then interviewing other coaches from my book and hearing about their experiences, that was really eye-opening for you because you go in and you just try and deliver things exactly as you would in your homeland but you soon realize that doesn't work like if i go into china and start asking questions i'm going to be met with silence because the education system you have 40 students sitting in a room and a teacher tells them exactly what to do and there's no it's not a two-way process it's a it's a monologue not a dialogue and they're not used to working in groups and things so if i go into china and start asking questions i'll be met with silence and they're not going to get anything from that and that's because they're not used to answering questions. And also there's a big thing called saving face. They don't want to get the answer wrong in front of the group because that'll affect their social status, which then reflects onto their family. And it's a lot more deeply rooted. It takes time to transition your methods. But initially when you go in, you need to be a bit more direct in your approach because if you start asking questions, they'll think, why does the coach not know the answer? Because their view of what great coaching is, it's someone that's a figurehead, someone that has all the answers, someone that's very dominant. So it takes a while to help them understand why you might need to answer questions, might might help you think about your game, or it's okay to get things wrong in front of the group, it's okay to make mistakes. So it's it takes a while to transition from what they've always done to the new approach. And it can happen, but it takes time, and you don't always get given that time in football. So that's one of the biggest challenges for coaches coaching abroad. How did you cope with that context? So you mentioned hierarchy in terms of age and a lack of community potentially in terms of you mentioned China and the, 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 the dialogue to, to communicate with others. How do you cope with that? Do you kind of seek support elsewhere? Do you kind of have to get on with it? I'm, I'm intrigued on how you, you dealt with that, those situations. They're very, very stressful. Like I, I would never go out much in terms of like back home and things. I'd always be very focused. I'd be coaching or like playing Saturday and Sunday. I wouldn't go out drinking much with my friends. Every Sunday in Thailand, I would go drinking with the president's son. And one of those things, honestly, it was, I've never, I'm not a big drinker. It was just that release. But then I was also building that relationship with him. And if I didn't have that relationship with him, I would have been sacked very, very quickly. But the thing for me was he was raised in New Zealand. 
So rich parents send their children abroad to study. So he had an understanding of my ideas and what I was trying to do. But if he had only ever been immersed within that Thai culture, that Thai environment, the way Thai coaches deliver things, I might not have lasted so long. So it's basically getting the him on side, getting the hierarchy on side buys you time. But then what I did was by the end of that first season, there's big, big problems. So the previous coach, the president's son, who was the academy director at that stage, he got rid of the previous coach because he lost lots of football. And then they had an agreement with another club that get their players to enter the Thai Youth League. But once that coach left, the players left as well. So they put the 14 and 15 year olds into the under 16, I think it was at the time, age group. It was under 17s, it was under 17s. So when I joined, this, the players were playing two years above them against the best players in the country. So at the start of the season, the results weren't very good. So when they started to panic, so they brought me in and it took me eight months to fix things because the players weren't in the right age groups. We didn't have the transfer window were closed, basically the registration window were closed, so we couldn't fix things. So basically it took me eight months. By the end of those eight months, I was able to get the players into the right age group. And I got rid of all the coaches because they weren't willing to work. They weren't willing to put the work in that is basic, basic requirements of being a coach. So I got rid of those guys, guys, brought new coaches in, set the bar high from day one. And then they were loyal to me because I gave them a job and I set the standards and knew exactly what was what was expected. So basically those things came together in terms of getting new staff in, building a strong relationship with the president's son, and then results improved once we got players into the right age group. But as I said, I would never survive that period if I hadn't have had the backing of the president's son. The micro politics of football, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They don't teach this in coaching courses. You know, I'm outside there in the countryside in Thailand. Everyone's taking photos of me. There's no foreigners. It's just you have to learn the hard way sometimes. And I did often have to learn the hard way. Yeah. You you, you said you made mistakes. What would what did those mistakes look like? I, I can presume you've obviously learned from those errors and that applied it into other practices. I'm intrigued to to figure out what kind of errors they might look like from maybe a a position of leadership. And you mentioned, you know, your standards. And you kind of have standards going into certain coaching environments and organizations. How did that kind of align with maybe those mistakes uh, and, and, and focusing on to develop the people that you're with and also the groups that you're coaching? I'm, I'm intrigued on that part. Yeah, one, one of the biggest things in Asia is the harmony of the group. The harmony of the group is the most important thing. And that's just always the way it is. It goes back to like ancient philosophers like Confucius, that whatever you do, you maintain the harmony of the group at all costs. And if you criticize someone individually in front of the group, that disrupts the harmony. So what happened was one of the coaches, one of the under 12 or under 14 coaches was watching an under 17 Thai youth league game. And he was instructing the players in Thai. And I said to my translator, like very, very politely, like tell him one voice, please, because he doesn't work with these players. He doesn't know what we're working on. He might be sending mixed messages. So he said that, the translator said that to the, the coach. The coach left and he never spoke to me again because he lost face in front of the players on the sideline. So wow. like these things, if I did that back home, there wouldn't be a problem. There wouldn't be a problem. You say it and they say, okay, right. Then you chat about it after you'd have it out. But there that had broken that relationship just because he lost face. He lost in front of the group. So it's that was one one mistake. And yeah, I learned I learned a lot from that one. It's just basically you gotta maintain the harmony of the group. You gotta pull people to the side and have those conversations. But even though I said it in a very nice way, it still it didn't go across very well. Yeah. How did that test you in terms of you getting your point across? And you mentioned your translator as well. Was that an element of patience and an element of frustration as well? Did that kind of happen as a, during that process? Yeah, well, that's that's the biggest thing. Like that's learning and I'd already had that experience in China, thankfully, so I was a bit I was okay. I'd done that before. But finding a good translator is the biggest is the biggest thing because all the paper I was academy director, so all the paperwork, all the logistics, everything's in Thai. So you need a really good person working alongside you. And I went through a lot of translators. Like initially the president's son was my translator. But he would just go AWOL sometimes. He wouldn't turn up. So I'd be standing there with a group of 18 players. They don't speak <laughs> English, any English at all. I don't speak Thai. And I'm trying to move combs around the floor. So it really teaches you about nonverbal communication and like learning basic trigger words and introducing those and like, the impact language has it's like it's, it's massive but once i got the right person in and also i just said another one as well i had a translator who spoke really good english but speak to the players she didn't understand football language 
there's a big difference between speaking good English in a restaurant or speaking good English socially in a sporting context is very different. So she was talking to the players and they weren't responding. They were looking at me with confused faces. So when I started speaking in basic Thai and they understood me better than her and like that weekend as well, we had the way match and she was coming from university. She was studying English and she was late and they said, do you want to wait for her? I was like, no, let's go. So I went to the match with a translator just because it's better me. I'd been there for a while at that stage, like using my basic Thai, using my trigger words and the players understood what we wanted by that stage because they worked together for a lot of months. But yeah, it was once I got my, my perfect, I found a translator who'd studied for three years in England, done a sports coaching degree and just came back. So he spoke good English. He understood my way of working, having been immersed in the European and the UK culture side of things. And he spoke football language. So that was to tick all the boxes for me. How how do you balance that in terms of you wanting to travel and see the country, but also you've got a job to fulfill and you've got all these added pressures and you've got these issues with translators and everything else that's on top of it. How do you kind of balance that in terms of your duty, but also ensuring that you are staying intrinsically driven and you're enjoying the process of being in another country? I'm intrigued on how you, you dealt with that. Yeah, that's, that's a difficult part. And for me, like, I had quite short contracts at the start. So I had eight months in one place, one year in another place. I got flown in for a month here. I got flown in for three weeks here. So it was, it was very much a job was taking me around. And then kind of at the end of the contract or during breaks, like you don't get much time off in football. So, and especially where I was in the outskirts of, in the countryside in Thailand, there was no work-life balance. It was just 24 seven on the job. I think it's just a fact that I've had the opportunity to work in so many countries and then I was you'd have the odd holiday you'd have the odd break but yeah it's not it's like if you look at social media people think it's a holiday it's, it's not like that I've had really difficult moments lying in a condo in Beijing can't even drink water my throat's closed I'm having to spit into a cup like people don't see that side of things yeah it's interesting it's interesting how the, the, the perception of of maybe traveling um, to all these countries is that the perception might be, yeah, it's brilliant, but also there's kind of these issues that you kind of mentioned. I, I presume that's kind of the, the the justification on why you read your book, right? In terms of sharing this knowledge and getting this information out there in terms of the realism of of, of trying to do this as a as a career, as an international coach. Yeah, well, it's, just, it's a smokescreen of social media. Like people don't understand how difficult it is to go to countries that are completely alien to anything that you've experienced before. It's like it's very challenging, especially as a single coach abroad. You don't have that family support network there. You don't have any friends. It just literally works 24-7 and people don't see that side of things. And then in terms of the book, it was just COVID came and like I left Singapore with no job and I'd never done that before. I'd always gone from one job to the next. This was the first time. That was in November, December 2019, like a matter of months before COVID started. So I flew back home for Christmas. And then I came back out to Asia with no job, thinking the world's my oyster. I was meeting clubs in Vietnam, uh, Philippines, Cambodia, Thailand, thinking that this is this is going to be easy. And then next thing, all the borders start, start closing. So when a guy calls me in New Zealand, come and stay at me for six months. So I flew to New Zealand to live with him for six months during COVID. And that's when I realized like things completely changed. Like I was owed money by my previous club. And the people I was working with, I was in for a job as assistant technical director. Like the guy who's my head coach in my previous club, he was technical director of a country of over 100 million people. He was going to bring me in as assistant technical director. And then COVID struck, everything shut down. And it's just like, is this the life I want? I want I lived in, I'd worked in 11 countries. I want to keep moving from place to place, never having a home, can get sacked after a number of months. And the time in between jobs is horrible. Like you're just waiting for the phone to ring. You're in a foreign country. You don't know many people. Like it's, it's a very lonely existence. So now I've written that book. I'm living in Phuket and I've got the best life balance I've had, but I'm only in this position now because I've had all those experiences previously and I realize that I have a little bit more stability now. And that's what I like. That's what I enjoy. I'm living in a beautiful place with beautiful beaches, one of the best like tourist destinations in the world. Whereas before I was always living in smoggy cities, which wasn't very good for my health. I was working 24 seven. There was no life balance, whereas now I've managed to to find that and then COVID was the perfect time to interview other people and hear their experiences and because there's no I'm not aware of any book that exists on coaching abroad so I knew it was never going to be a bestseller because it's a very niche thing but I just wanted to encapsulate all the things I've experienced and lessons and get lessons from other people who've been much, much more successful than me, by myself to, to share it with people and it only benefits two or three people who go abroad and get jobs and love it then that's that like, job well done. 
Is there ever a point just on reflection of what you just mentioned and maybe a, a reflection of maybe the broader um, experiences that you've had that, you know, you mentioned 24 hours working in a, a place where you're unfamiliar with the language barrier. There's a sense of loneliness where you just think, I, I just want to go home. Like I, I've just had enough here. Have you ever been in a position in a position like that? And I'm intrigued on how you've kept your persistence because there must be times where you doubt the process. There must be times where you think, I just want to go back and be in a place where I can have a sense of community and be able to kind of get by speaking my own language. I'm just intrigued on that process and how you keep persistent because from my perspective, it's very brave, but also there must be an element of, I need to keep doing this to achieve what my long-term aims are. Yeah, 100%. And the thing for me was back home, even though there aren't many full-time jobs, there's nothing really that excites me to go back home. And if I went back there, I'm not even sure I'd be able to get a job in coaching. You know what I mean? I might have to change my career and go in a different in a different direction. That's not something that really appeals to me. So obviously you miss your family, you miss your friends and things and the, the home comforts. But for me, just being out here is just a lot more exciting. And I've, I've lived in so many different countries and so I understand what kind of place suits me. And I feel so comfortable in Thailand here. The people are so friendly. It's such a nice place to live. But yeah, I've been through, as you said before, I've been through many, so many difficult moments. And like China was very difficult when I got sick. Like I had to go home because I was just, I was very, very sick there. Like my throat closed. As I said, I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink. I was Googling how many days you can survive for if I eat or drinking because like, my throat was that bad. I just didn't want to go to a hospital. It was, it was a very daunting process. I was in a lot of pain. I was by myself and it's just like these kind of experiences make you realize that like some things are more important than football, some things are more important than coaching. And when I first went abroad, everything was career, career, career. I must work here. I must do that. And I was never happy. Like I just kept jumping from one place to the next, thinking that that next job would bring me happiness. And I soon realized that that's, that's not the case. And even like where I was in Thailand, eventually what was going to happen was the president's son was going to take over the club. He was going to put me as B team head coach and then first team head coach. So I was going to be first team head coach in a, in a Thai league, which is good level. Like the foreign coaches that we had around 15,000 US dollars a month. So it would have been good money, it would be a good experience. But then the money just dries up overnight. And it's, and that's just not, it's just not a great lifestyle. And there's so many people out here earning $1,000, $1,500 a month, trying to get that jump to the 5,000, 8,000 contracts. And the vast majority never get there. And they're having to live out of suitcases, moving from place to place. There's no stability. And it's just a very uncertain, uncertain lifestyle. And that's and the COVID, if I had me for COVID, I'd probably still be there. I'd probably still be doing it. But it's just that time to sit back and reflect and like, does this make me happy? Or am I just doing this to try and boost my CV, to get these clubs in my CV to put this in my social media handles so I look good in front of others? Like, is this really what I want? Or am I just trying to keep myself that I am it's kind of a bigger part of identity? I was the same as a football player as well. Like when I stopped playing, everyone's like, oh, like you're the footballer and you lose that identity. You lose a big part of who you are. Whereas now I don't need my self-worth. Is it wrapped up into my job title? It's not wrapped up into like what am I what am I achieving? It's just, it's basically wrapped up in values now because before I was like, and even during COVID, it's like, I must get to China. I must get to Philippines. I must get to these countries. And it's just caused me so much anxiety because there's so much uncertainty. So that's when I stripped it back and thought, okay, I'm going to start living from free values. So I'm living from um, curiosity, caring for myself and others and creativity. And if I link actions to those three things every day, that's what brings me satisfaction. And that's the real important thing. And if I keep doing good things, good things will happen in the future. But like those free values are much more important things in the future because I was never living in the moment. I was always looking at the next job, the next role. Whereas now I'm actually happy where I am living these free values every day. And that's... That's the best I've ever felt. So that's a great position to be in for me. Very interesting how you've had a little bit of a, a spiritual awakening in terms of maybe your experiences and how to be more present and how to enjoy the journey. We mentioned at the beginning of the podcast around like the micro politics of, of sports organizations and how that's not taught. Do you think something around maybe the, the mental well-being of, of being a coach and the fulfillment of enjoying the process and not getting caught up in the rat race of trying to get from a to b as fast as you can do you think that's a limited outlook within maybe the coaching education that we have of 
actually, you know, you, you need to learn and you can learn and develop in certain ways. It's not all about employment. It's not all about getting to the next destination. You can kind of grow and mature and appreciate and have gratitude in what you're doing. Do you think that's limited in, in some regard? Yeah, definitely. It's very heavily focused on the X's and O's, isn't it? In terms of that side of things and like talking about values and also support network. I think support network is the biggest thing, like especially for me traveling the world by myself. I was always alone. I didn't have people around me. And what I found interviewing the coaches was that they, might, they spoke about family, like being their security net having that to help them switch off that's such a big part of part of things and like for me it was just always football 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 but like football doesn't come around at christmas you know when you, you find yourself by yourself during these moments when there's down periods in football and you're alone you don't have that connection you're in the middle of nowhere no, no one can speak to you you don't know what foods to eat like it's, yeah there's so much more that could be done in terms of like the life balance aspect and also changing the mentality of the grind mentality like you still be a good coach and have hobbies too other things you enjoy that help you stay re-energized to come back and be an even better coach. But it's almost like a badge of honor when you're burning yourself out that, oh, he's a top coach, like 24 seven, that's all it is. But that's not the thing for me. Like you need other things in your life because like football is such a roller coaster. You have so many moments when you're down and you need a release from that just as a, a same for players, same for coaches. I think that's just such an element we need to get to get better at. But that badge of honor of burning out, it's, it's okay to have hobbies. It's okay to take a day off. That's, that's fine. It can actually re re energize you and make you a better coach. How did you kind of get over those obstacles? Is there anything that you kind of learned spiritually, mentally, or, or professionally around kind of those challenges whilst working in 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 those countries where you, you kind of experienced those moments? At least try and plan your days off. And that's the thing I'm not very good at because what would happen is you just work, 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 and then it's your day off and you don't have anything planned. So like planning to go on a hike or planning to try and meet people. Like I wasn't probably social enough in these places but just trying to find hobbies things you enjoy that's such a big part of it and even in like where i was in thailand i fly to bangkok just to talk english to people you know what i mean just to go and have meet people because there weren't any foreigners there so it's, it's basically wrapped up in the activities and the things i value that was the best way to get from it because you don't always have those people there it's hard to meet people you work in football because your schedule so anti social like when everyone's at work, you're off. And then when you're, you're at work, everyone's off. And it seems the weekends as well. Like it's very challenging. So so what are the long-term aims then, Blaine? It, like you mentioned the countries that you visited and the countries that you've um, <laughs> been employed in and you've coached in. Is, what's what's the long-term aim here? What, what's, what are you trying to achieve? Is there anything that you've set out personally that you might want to share with, with viewers and listeners that might be intrigued on your journey? Well, if you had asked me that question years ago, there would have been a clearly bang goal. I could have told you I want to reach it by this year. But like for me now, I'm very happy where I am. And it's the first time I've ever been happy where I am. I'm very content. And I want to stay where I am for a number of years, moving forward, and try and build a football program, try and build connections and just enjoy, have a bit of life balance for once. And like I'm not looking too far into the future because what that holds, no one knows. But as long as I keep living from my values of caring for myself, caring for others, creating things, I'm being curious and developing myself. I know good things will come from that. But in terms of if you ask me exactly what the future holds, like I'm not worrying about the future right now, which is the first time in my life I've been like that. And like I'm very happy not to be because I like I love where I am and what I'm doing. So being being present is probably the the, the key element within your practice today, yeah. Yeah, exactly, because it could all be over tomorrow, you know what I mean? Like, you don't know what the future holds, and the most important thing is where you are right now and what you're doing right now, and then from there, good things will come, but that's uh, that's often the part people struggle with. They're great if they're long-term goals where they want to get to, but they're not very good in the moment where they are. They're not fulfilled. They're not enjoying what they're doing necessarily, so like I think the starting point is the present moment, and if we can all get better at managing that and where we are, then... Like it'll lead to a better, happier, brighter future. What advice would you give to those that might be watching or listening this that want to coach abroad or want to experience maybe a new way of life, a new culture, a new method in terms of different areas and putting themselves out of their comfort zone and experiences, experiencing new places? What advice would you maybe give to someone if you could kind of go back to the younger Blaine and give someone maybe that? Um, information to kind of support them in terms of their journey. What 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 advice would you give to to a young student, a young coach, a young person wanting to to maybe consider this process? Well, that's essentially what 
my book was all about. I was basically writing it to a younger version of myself in terms of like, tell me all the things that I wish I had have known that would have made the process easier. And like, there's chapters in the book on like networking is such a big thing. So building connections with people. And since I've traveled, because when you live at home, you live in a bubble, you've got a network there. But once you start traveling to different places and meeting people, that's when doors, like doors open when you land. If you start sending emails from your home country to some of the far side of the world, like they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to take you seriously. And it's the thing in China, like Chinese football was booming. They were starting, the Chinese Super League was starting to boom. There was massive salaries. All coaches want to go there. But going from your home country into a professional job in China would have been basically impossible for the people I interviewed in the book. So we moved there in grass, full-time grassroots roles, built up a network, showed the quality of our work. And then I think it was maybe five, five of us ended up working in professional clubs around Asia, which would have been impossible if we hadn't made that jump to work there in grassroots. So like for me, travel, research the places you want to work and then go there on holiday, meet people, do different things, and then you develop networks, show the quality of your work, and then things will kind of go from there. But then also you need to listen, like listen to podcasts, read, read my book, number one, listen to podcasts of people who've worked and lived abroad, just try and get... Basically, it's about opening your mind. Like I wrote two um, two chapters on culture and the biggest thing was opening your mind. I've also got a chapter in the book called Why Coaches Fail Abroad. And it's the seven reasons of why coaches fail. And the biggest thing is not understanding the culture because you can't get the best in the local people you're working with. You've got no chance of succeeding and you will have to significantly adapt your approach in different countries going in there, seeing how things work, getting the locals on side. And then starting to make small changes once you realize how things work. Because if you go in there and try and rip everything up from day one, you lose everyone and you won't be able to achieve it. So like there's so many different elements to it. And that's why I tried to make the book a bit broad range in terms of like the different things you need to learn. But that's just a few, a few ideas. How does one adapt to the culture then? Um, you just got to talk to the local people. You just got to be very observant. And that's the thing. Like I made so many mistakes culturally. Like in the Middle East, I went to shake a woman's hand. And you don't do that there. You don't offer your hand first. She offers your hand, then you can shake it. But you don't offer your hand to a woman first in that part of the world. So it's like I made lots of mistakes culturally. But traveling to different places, observing how people act, how people behave, that's one of the biggest things. And also teach you as well, when you're unsure, to follow other people's leads. So just putting yourself in different environments, observing what goes on around you. And you can read about it online, but it's only once you're there in the environment, you're talking to the locals, but how do you adapt to things? You're talking to other coaches. That's the that's the biggest thing. So you, you learn from observing and the people around you. But if you go in there with your attitude that you're better than everyone else, you come from this country, which is, then you're not going to survive. You're not going to succeed. So it's you got to be very humble, very open-minded, and very adaptable and patient because things aren't going to be like they are back home. And you have to accept that because you're a visitor in their country and you have to get the best from the local people and adapt to them, not the other way around. So you, you mentioned the book, and the book is a, an excellent read in terms of supporting coaches that want to get jobs and succeed worldwide. Let's kind of bring it back to the beginning. So how did it become a process? You kind of spoke about it briefly during our conversation, but how did this become a um, a thing for you to write? You mentioned COVID and that bit of a break to kind of self-reflect, I presume, was, was part of that process. But how did it come about? And you mentioned the other people that you worked with and network with i'm sure that they helped you within the journey as well yeah i'd always i said like years and years ago when i was in china i decided that i wanted to write a book for some reason i'm not really sure why i wanted to write a book but it was always kind of just as bubbling under the surface and initially i'd sort of written a a book about my experiences in all the different countries but the more i wrote it the more it was just kind of a diary for myself to reflect on so like different countries i'd could read my chapter in China, all the stories and interesting things that happened because your mind's only so strong. You can't remember everything. So it's kind of just good to chart all the stories and things. But now I see that more as a memento for myself than sort of making it widespread. So on social media, the question I get asked most is, how do you get jobs abroad? How did you do this? And that just came to be, seemed to be a recurring theme on social media. But I just decided to write a book on it because like nothing exists out there on coaching abroad. I'm not aware of any any books, so especially specific to football as well. So I just thought it was a great opportunity. And for me, coaching abroad has changed my life. I want to share that with other people. There's so many people out there that love football and they're not really sure what they want to do with their lives. And 
I want to be, and that's why also social media, that was a big thing for me because when I was growing up, there weren't many role models. It was like Jose Mourinho on TV and that wasn't, that wasn't realistic for the majority of people. So I wanted to kind of portray a realistic role model that worked in different countries with an achievable pathway to follow. And that was kind of the, the main thing of it. So yeah, I just wanted to help coaches bring their football ambitions to life because like, if you look at the stories in the book, there was one guy who was working full-time insurance in the UK and he was coaching in like, I think it was like the 11th division as an assistant coach in his B license. And this guy says to him, look, we've just lost, the Philippines just lost their national team head coach. You should apply for the job. And he's like, are you serious? I'm, I'm full-time insurance, part-time in football, B license assistant in like the 11th tier of English football. He's like, I've got no chance to get the job. And then he went there. And that was just at the time whenever the half English, half Filipinos were coming through, like Neil Etheridge and things, they went there. He did unbelievably well. He got to the semifinals of Suzuki Cup, first time in their history. And then from there, he's getting jobs and big contracts all around this region. So it like, completely changed his life. And it's just kind of sharing those stories of people, what they've been through and like people, the corruption that goes on, the different things, it just kind of opens your mind and seeing the pathways that other people have been through provides inspiration. And then they also give advice within the book as well, about how to get jobs and how to succeed all around the world. It's, like, it's just fascinating talking to people that have worked in 28 different countries around the world with stories because like, it's just it would just blow your mind some of the things that are happening. It's, it's just great for people wanting to get jobs. It's also great for people wanting to just hear about stories of football in different countries. Mm. You said corruption. What what kind of things would happen within that? Yeah, just, there's one coach who <laughs> was walking off the field. It, it was nil-nil at half time. There's one coach who was walking down the tunnel at half time and one of the foreign players in the opposite team said that you'll win this match and it was like 1-0 or 2-0 because the other team had already put the money on that the opposite the opponents were going to win 2-0 and they went on they won that match exactly what that guy had told them so it's wow. just the things like that and there's one coach they're going for the league title and then the owner of the, the president of the club said to him he's got the owner of the other team who they're playing against on the phone and he says the result will cost a couple of thousand dollars and then the coach is like no 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 i will win doing things properly and then they came out the next day but the other team was accusing him of match fixing and then but they you just you just don't know sometimes and then there was another <laughs> there was a a player only joined the club so a big player in a country joined the club but he only joined the club if his two friends would join as well so the club agreed signed his two friends but then the head coach didn't play his two friends and the big player he was getting a percentage of their salary for every appearance they made so because they weren't playing the guy went to the owner of the club and says look he's lost the dressing room the coach has lost the dressing room and he sacked him just because that guy wasn't getting his money so like you've got to understand these things and it's like it's completely different I'm, I'm sure these things happen in other parts of europe and things as well but just like hearing these stories and what goes on behind the scenes like you, you wouldn't believe it and it just it opens your mind and realizes that what you're up against like you'd be the best coach in the world, but if you kind of adapt to the culture, understand what's going on around you, you've got no chance of succeeding. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Can what what can learners learn from from the book? What are the main takeaways? Is there anything that kind of stands out for you, Blaine, in terms of you know your reflection? Is there anything that kind of you think is very important in terms of significance within the book? Is there anything that you think that stands out that that learners or coaches need to kind of take on board going going abroad? Is there any is there a key factor within the book that you've written? Yeah, well, I break that down into the the final chapter. One of the biggest things is is networking and showing the quality of your work. So, like, you can have a network in terms of knowing lots of people, but once you know people that have seen you work and your qualities, what you possess, that's what makes the difference. That will people will because their names in the line. If they recommend you for things, their names in the line. So they have to know how good you are. So it's about developing those connections with people. And the more countries you have these connections, the more opportunities are going to be open to you. So I think that's one of the one of the biggest the biggest things in terms of in terms of your network and the showing the quality of your work. And I break it down into three. It's so long since I've written the book, I can barely remember some of the stuff. But it's one of the things like profiles, like what you've got on your on your CV, the things that kind of black and white in your CV. Another thing is reputation. So what people say about you. And then the third thing is performance because everyone's going to judge you based on what they see in the training ground. So if you can bring those three things together in terms of having a profile of credible teams in your CV, having achieved success, met the objectives and exceeded the objectives of clubs in the past. 
and then your day-to-day performance is top level in terms of the coaching, what you deliver in the field, your communication, your relationships, and then free your reputation so people are spreading positive messages about you. If you can bring those three things together, then you'll be on to you'll be on to a winner. But then also understanding, not going against what I've said earlier, knowing what where you want to get to because so many of the coaches that went to different Asian countries or different countries outside Europe, their achievements and what they've done doesn't get them jobs back home unless they know someone. So like there's a guy who's earning, he got paid six figures USD for getting sacked. Reportedly got paid six figures USD for getting sacked with a national team. So allegedly he got paid three hundred thousand dollars for getting sacked. But he goes home and he can't get a job in the Scottish third or fourth division of four hundred pounds a month. So it's like, it doesn't always add up. People don't understand like someone hiring someone that's worked in China, worked in Thailand, worked in South Africa, worked in wherever. They don't understand those experiences. It's hard for them to translate that into their environment. So like, one of the biggest things is building that reputation in the place you want to be long term and start working your way up. Because if you go to somewhere else, you'll be out of sight, out of mind unless you've got a strong network to get back in. What we'll do, Blaine, is we'll put the link to the book in the description. So if anyone's listening or watching this podcast, they can go and check that out and, and purchase that if they want to find out a little bit more about coaching abroad um, and the experiences, obviously, that you've, you've mentioned. They might be able to relate to that in terms of the book as well. So we'll put that in the description. Final question from me. Uh, what I tend to do on the last question of every guest that I have, I tend to get them to either look um, back or forward. And I think for you, it'd be nice to kind of look forward. I know you said you like to be in the present moment, but maybe, you know, when the time comes where you are retiring from coaching and you look back, is there anything that you want to maybe perceive as a legacy? Is there anything that you want to kind of achieve uh, in terms of legacy and how that might uh, look like in terms of you doing these challenges working abroad etc is there anything that kind of stands out for you in terms of what your objectives are in terms of your career pathway well this is this is an interesting thing I'll, I'll kind of go to the past first to answer the question one of the most satisfying things the most satisfying jobs i ever had and i like looking at things statistically like when you come in what you inherited and what you're able to turn it into and like we we brought the first ever national coaching course to Ubon, Rajatani, a region of Thailand. So normally football doesn't really exist outside Bangkok. Like all the best courses that are, everything's kind of catered towards the city and the rural areas don't get the kind of same support. So we were able to bring the first national coaching course to there. I was able to set up programs in the universities for over a hundred coaches. And in that region, not many of them spoke English. So they only had the Thai resources available to them. So we were bringing different educational components to them. We set up schools programs over 300 kids. We renovated in one week, three of our players end up hospital with motorbike accidents because there's no public transport network. The only way they can get the training is on a motorbike. And a lot of underage people ride motorbikes with no helmets and things. So we renovate our truck to give them a safe way to get to the field. And then if any, we saw anyone ride without a helmet, they'd be banned from playing the next match. So we set so many different things in place and for me that's what gives me the most satisfaction of being able to see the impact you've had within the region we're able to help players when we first arrived there were like two or three academy teams we created a full pathway up to the b team which was seeing players sign first team contract professional contracts get into the first team like these are the things i look back on with the most pride so same as where i'm at now like i want to try and build something like the program i started here had 47 players in it now we've got 140. So I just love seeing things build, giving opportunities to people and trying to create a legacy and seeing what you can develop develop things into. So for me, based on those previous experiences and the satisfaction that brought me, I'd like to, I like building things and bringing them forward and then helping, helping people ultimately and creating positive, positive projects. And that's one of the biggest things that leads into my values as well, like creativity. So creating projects and things that help, help people. But I suppose that's, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's that's what's on top of my mind. So, so for listeners and viewers, where can they find you, Blaine, in terms of your work? I presume you're on social media. You said you like to share your work as well. So, where can people maybe contact you if they want to find out a little bit more about yourself? Um, Twitter at Blaine McKenna seventy seven, which basically is about coaching related things. Instagram, which is where I post pictures of where I live and the place I've been, is at bmck seven seven. And then type my name to LinkedIn as well. 
Um, my DMs are open on Twitter and things. I'm always happy to, as long as someone, like some people say, hi, how are you? I don't like responding to that necessarily. <laughs> but if someone says something specific, then I will always respond. Excellent. What we'll do again, like your book, we'll, we'll put those links in the description. Um, so if anyone wants to connect with you on social media and uh, send you a, a hi, how are you on Twitter, <laughs> they can. Um, from my personal perspective, Land, I just want to say thank you for your time. Um, your journey in terms of traveling um, to other countries is very impressive uh, and it's a very brave and bold journey that you've been on. So I just want to wish you well with that um, and good luck in the future. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's always great to, to chat all things football around the world. Thank you, Blaine. Cheers.